This is an episode of Reasonably Sound Classic. For the first 30-some episodes, this podcast was distributed by Infinite Guest, American Public Media's podcast network. Thus, it benefited from blanket broadcast licenses held with every music publisher. After going independent, pretty much all intro, outro, and interstitial music had to be removed. The intro and outro music you're going to hear is an in-progress version of Reasonably Sound's theme, written by Will Stratton. The awkward silences are where act break music used to be, so if you could just imagine like Queen or the Misfits or Kate Bush along the way, that would be great. If you want to support Reasonably Sound in the hopes that maybe one day I'll be able to afford some blanket licenses of my own, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Okay, on with the show. Hi there. My name is Mike Rugnetta, and this podcast is Reasonably Sound. Today, on Reasonably Sound, subliminal auditory messages. They're not playing yet, but soon. So, if you don't want to risk having your auditory senses magically bypassed and your subconscious stimulated, now's the time to tune out. Of course, pretty much any set of responsible research has shown that subliminal auditory messages produce either no effect in listeners or align perfectly with results predicted by the placebo effect, but well, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. However, you never know. Maybe here, today, on Reasonably Sound, my voice, the power of suggestion will overcome all bio and psychological barriers and the subliminal messages that follow will actually cause you to become more confident, a faster reader, more devoted to your significant other, more willing to work out, respectful of your elders, a calmer, more patient motorist, a more funny circus clown, a less fearful skateboarder, or a more steady-handed calligrapher or heart surgeon. What follows is three minutes of calming, soothing sounds paired with positively themed subliminal auditory messages created using some of the same techniques used by self-help companies. Once it's over, we'll talk about what is even going on here and why people ever thought this was a thing that actually worked.
Okay. How are y'all feeling? Like you're going to go to the gym more? Eat fewer devil dogs? Maybe like you're going to win friends and influence people? Instead of me telling you exactly what it is you just opted to have not so secretly mainlined direct to your psyche, that is, assuming all the research saying this kind of stuff is silly and ridiculous, is itself silly and ridiculous, you are going to tell me. What'd you feel? Did you get some overwhelming vibes from these subliminal messages? Let me know on Twitter at ReasonablySND if there are particularly good ones, or if someone gets close to the subject matter of the previously experienced subliminal auditory messages. I'll let you know in two weeks at the end of the next episode. But okay, so what? Subliminal auditory messages? Yes. If you are familiar with the term, you're probably familiar with the idea. There is some kind of message masked within a larger complex of media, sometimes containing other sounds, sometimes not, and it worms its way into your brain zone such that it will cause you to change your habits, learn some piece of complicated information, influence your behavior or outlook, and so on and so forth. Mostly, when we hear of subliminal auditory messaging of any kind, we go right to the less than altruistic uses of it. Stuff like advertising and secret messages baked into our media by the lizard people. The history of subliminal messaging begins with visual media, and so not strictly auditory stuff. So for a couple minutes, I hope that you'll forgive me for setting the stage with some stuff not strictly within the purview of reasonably sound, but which I hope it's not too forward of me to claim is interesting nonetheless. In 1957, this guy by the name of James Vickery, a market researcher, of course, conducted an experiment where he showed a film to an audience, and in that film inserted one frame long messages. So every once in a while for a sixteenth of a second, which I think is how long a frame was in 1957, 16 frames a second. I'm not entirely sure. Very quick, for a very not long amount of time, a message would flash on the screen during this movie and it would say, drink Coca-Cola in all caps, or buy popcorn. And Vickery said that sales of those things increased significantly. Almost 60% for popcorn, almost 20% for Coke. Except, not actually. It turned out not long after that the whole thing was a gimmick. Not only did it prove difficult to repeat the astounding effects of Vickery's research, it also proved difficult to prove whether Vickery ever did such research in the first place. But, as is the case today, like right now, with the whole vaccines causing autism debate, which, you know, they don't, The message got out and, for whatever set of reasons, was much more compelling than the scientifically supported truth. From Vickery on, the idea of subliminal messages, especially in advertising, having an effectiveness has held at least some amount of sway with a good portion of the public. A portion who, I would guess, is also keeping the tinfoil hat industry alive. Tinfoil hats, protecting your sensitive neural receptors from secret Soviet radio messages since 1957. The idea that subliminal adverts actually have some potential effect on our brains, and by extension the movement of our limbs, as so willed by our intentions, held enough sway, actually, that Canada outright banned them after a 1973 commercial for the kids' game Husker Du, not the 1980s Minnesotan rock band Husker Du, flashed single frames with the words, Get it in an apparent, though unconfirmed, attempt to influence parents and children to run to the store and spend their hard-earned money on, quote, the memory game with no language barrier. Having never played Husker Du, I can only imagine what that means. Each player tries to find matching pieces by removing two discs. If the pictures match, he keeps the discs. A star. He's seen that before. He remembers and gets another turn. 36 pictures impossible to memorize. No complicated rules. It's easy to play. Hooskadoo. Only $3.99 from Pickup. Subliminal advertising techniques have been banned in Canada, the UK, and Australia. And while they are not strictly verboten in the US, there's a kind of agreement amongst the Ad Council that secret messages, just barely towing the line of conscious perception, probably shouldn't be included in any form of major market advertising. 
If this episode of Reasonably Sound makes it past the censors, then I might recommend wearing your tinfoil hat whenever listening to other Infinite Guest podcasts. You never know. You can never be too safe. Anyways, the outright banning of the let me remind you again, not actually effective subliminal tactics didn't stop lots of people, especially in the 80s and early 90s from choosing to subject themselves to subliminal messages in the name of self-improvement. And here we get back to audio. Thank you for being patient. Just kidding. The whole last segment had subliminal messages, which were telling you to be patient. I'm inside your brain. Personal anecdotal evidence would suggest that for a period of time from about the late 80s to sometime in the mid-90s, there was a hypnosis and subliminal messaging fad that coincided with what I would also identify as the height of cassette tape sales. This correlation is completely non-scientific. It feels right, but as we all know, just because something seems to make sense doesn't mean it's correct. So I want to be clear about that. I was also maybe like... 10 years old, so it's perfectly possible that I had absolutely no clue what was going on around me if it didn't have to do with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or Chrono Trigger. For whatever it's worth, though, in prep for this episode, I read a fair amount of research on the effects of subliminal auditory messages on the habits and perceptions of its listeners, and a vast, vast majority of it dealt with tapes, cassette tapes, purchased in retail locations in the United States around the late 80s to early 90s and sold with the promise of all kinds of personal improvements. If you were or remain a fan of the American sitcom Friends, you might remember the one with the hypnosis tape where Rachel Hans Chandler, played by a gaunt and more frantic looking than usual Matthew Perry, a hypnosis tape in the hopes it will help him quit smoking which he does inside the central perk. Man, the 90s were really like the Dark Ages, right? Anyways, Chandler listens to the tape, and it helps him stop smoking, but it also has some other side effects. Here, let's listen to the content of the tape as it is played on the show. You are falling fast asleep. Deeper, deeper, deeper. You are now completely asleep. You don't need to smoke. Cigarettes don't control you. You are a strong, confident woman who does not need to smoke. A strong, confident woman. The joke, of course, is that Chandler then begins acting like a woman, complimenting others' clothing, applying chapstick, walking out of the bathroom after a shower wrapped in a towel, all things we know that no self-respecting 90s man would ever do unless he was brainwashed. Again, 90s. This episode ends with Joey replacing the calming female voice on the tape with his own, telling Chandler to make him cheese sandwiches and buy him pants. Forgiving, against my better judgment, any weird, vaguely homophobic humor, this represents pretty solidly the attitude I remember existing around these tapes some 20 to 25 years ago, that there is some hidden pathway to the psyche which, when traversed by properly produced audible media, will unlock or implant some particular predilection without any effort on the part of the listener. But, but, well, I mean, that's not really how it works. Not exactly, anyway. In the cases where subliminal messages work, they're not really what most of us think when we think subliminal messages. And they won't really work in the way we think of them working. Anyone who has ever seen a Darren Brown sketch probably knows exactly what I'm getting at. Anyways, I asked my friend Vanessa Hill, who is the creator of the YouTube show Braincraft, which is about psychology and neuroscience, if she could take some time out of her busy travel schedule to explain what subliminal messages really are and how they really work. Here's her dispatch from the road. Hello, Mike Ragnetta. It's Vanessa. I'm in San Francisco in a hotel room. There's drum noises outside and like people cheering and I'm not really sure what's happening so the curtains are closed hope it's not weirdly noisy at times but we will see what happens so subliminal messages are, are really cool they're super interesting because they carefully walk the line between 
our conscious and unconscious. Like we can't perceive them per se, but they have been shown to influence our behavior. So our brains receive so much information all the time that we don't consciously notice. So we have different thresholds to be able to distinguish signals and stimuli. Our sensory threshold is where we sense something but unconsciously. So maybe uh, like the really faint smell of a food that makes you hungry, but you don't actually realise what is making you hungry the time you just want to eat. And the other one is a perceptual threshold where the stimuli are made conscious. So uh, maybe when you suddenly realise there's been a lot of traffic noise or something outside your apartment for a while and you, you should probably go and look and see if there's anything happening. So a subliminal message needs to be experienced above this sensory threshold but below our perceptual threshold. And this experience is where cocktail parties come in. Seriously, there's something called the cocktail party effect. And when I was an undergraduate student, it seemed so fun compared to my lectures I was in that I remembered it really well, arguably better than anything I learned in my first year of university. <laughs> so imagine you're at a cocktail party and there's lots of people talking and there's music and there's random noise like party poppers or drums or, you know, a, a vuvuzela but you can still talk to one person next to you and you can concentrate on what they're saying. So we have selective auditory attention. Your brain filters unimportant sounds out. And, and this is why you can do this. This is why this happens. You still physically perceive all of the noise, all of the noise at the party, right, or, or in real life. So the tiny little hairs in your ears experience the vibrations and they send an electrical signal through your auditory nerve to your cortex, your auditory cortex. There's differing theories about what's actually happening in your brain for you to have this selective attention. Some suggest there's a filter model where our brains block out the information that we don't selectively attend to. And there's another model called the attenuation model where we have that filter mechanism, but things aren't completely blocked out. So things become conscious to you when you hear words that you think are of semiotic importance. So imagine you're at that party and you hear your name and suddenly your ears prick up when you're really aware of it. That is that model. The problem, there's always a problem, isn't there? <laughs> Nothing can be like really clear cut in science. But the problem with measuring the impact of subliminal auditory messages in a scientific sense is that those thresholds that I mentioned of actually perceiving a message are somewhat unique from person to person. Some studies have shown that messages do have an effect on our behavior, but lots of studies have also been inconclusive and they haven't shown anything. So we really can't say that they have an impact or an effect on our behavior with any certainty. Drum circles, San Francisco. Who would have guessed? Thank you so much, Vanessa, for that. It is very helpful. And we now have a framework to apply to Chandler's hypnosis tape. If we do that, right, the idea is pretty straightforward. The audio is above both his sensory and perceptual thresholds. Though I suppose you could argue that the hypnosis audio is below his perceptual threshold, but only because he's asleep. Okay, this is not nearly as straightforward as I just promised you it would be. Either way, the idea here is that whatever conscious or subconscious roadblocks Chandler has to quitting smoking, they're going to be bypassed because while he's asleep, it's like, I don't know, you're like a blank, non-resisting slate onto which a tape will inscribe desirable habits. The subliminal auditory messages, as opposed to the hypnosis ones, are, as Vanessa said, meant to be above our sensory threshold, but below our perceptual threshold. We sense, but do not perceive the subliminal content, though we are fully conscious and present for the experience of it. The obvious question now is, how? How do they do it? 
Now, depending upon where you got your subliminal audio tape, it would claim to use one of a few methods to do its magic. Either way, to your ear, you would be listening to nature sounds or smooth jazz or new age synthesizer music. There were some tapes that veered into bebop or actual rock and roll, but those were few and far between. Most of these tapes deal exclusively in calming and relaxing soundscapes. The intent here is to communicate that this is the spoonful of sugar to help the medicine go down. Your brain is about to accept a heavy dose of important and actionable secret messages, so one must soothe it, relax it, allow it to open up, or something. In other words, if one is spending cognitive cycles on the mentally exhausting task of listening to actually good music, one is not nearly in the state required to properly accept subliminal messages. There's also this mysticism hinted at by the playback of nature soundscapes or new age music, and that's, that's something that we'll get back to in a second. So... While you're listening to the ocean sounds or some two-bit Yanni knockoff, there is another element of sonic information, so it is claimed, that you are not hearing. It's present, but you can't hear it. And it is in not being able to consciously perceive it that you are not able to consciously resist it. How, though, does one make this information present yet imperceptible? Ah, much like the snake oil salesman in the centuries past, no two techniques are exactly the same, yet somehow they are all simultaneously the best. Among them were the following scams, I mean schemes, for hiding auditory information in plain hearing. Some tape makers claimed that their messages were hyper-compressed, such that there were upwards of some tens of thousands of messages over the course of an hour-long side of one tape. So, like, let's say I record the phrase, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. And I speed it up. It sounds like this. I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. If I continue to speed it up, eventually it becomes a tone, and eventually it is sped up so quickly that its frequencies exist beyond the range of human hearing. Another technique is similar but different. It's possible to increase the pitch of the recording without increasing its speed, like so. I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. If we keep doing this over and over and over again, the message doesn't speed up, but again, it gets to beyond the range of human hearing. Other techniques involve claiming that messages are at normal speed, normal pitch, but just below the amplitude threshold of normal human hearing. and various other who-knows-what patented trade secret ways of making audio information there, but not such that you might curb your desire to curse or eat cookies before bed. Either way, Myra J. Staum and Melissa Brotos in 1992 for their paper The Influence of Auditory Subliminals on Behavior, a series of investigations for the Journal of Music Therapy, decided it might be worth putting a sizable selection of these tapes through a spectrogram. This is a type of analysis which displays the spectral content of of sound. You take a very small, momentary slice of audio and you see, literally, visually, what frequencies are present and how strong they are. Think of it kind of like a heat map. If there is sound present at a certain frequency, it is depicted on a spectrogram. The stronger or louder the areas with many present frequencies, the brighter that section. Staum and Brotos thought, well, if there's something there, anything, even if it's beyond the range of human hearing, it'll show up in the spectrogram. Even if it's far above the range of what we're capable of perceiving, the digital audio system will get it. Which it would. And if some of these tapes claim to have 80,000 messages per hour-long tape, surely that would mean at any instant there would be something on the spectrogram. Somewhere that we'd be able to see as evidence of this very powerful subliminal auditory messaging. Do you want to guess what they found? I bet you already know.
Subliminal Auditory Messages and Evaluation, a paper by Philip M. Mareichel, whose last name I'm probably destroying, from the University of Waterloo and published in the Journal of Psychology and Marketing, Volume 5, Number 4, ends with the following and absolutely genius bombshell of academically rendered shade-throwing. Quote, In spite of our failure to find any support whatsoever for the many and varied claims concerning these cassettes, it is probably safe to predict that the present evidence will be completely ignored by everyone who wishes to continue to believe in the mystical nature of subliminal perception. So, en route to our conclusion, let's talk about that mystical nature Mareichel mentions, about mysticism. And let's do it by talking first about the famous beat writer William S. Burroughs and his ideas about the human language and cassette tapes, as expressed in an essay called The Electronic Revolution. Burroughs thought that the written word came first in the evolution of humankind. He thought that the spoken word only exists in service of the written word, not the other way around, as it's normally thought. He also thought that our capability for language is literally a virus, like flu, herpes, West Nile, language. Language is a virus, was a mantra of his. The language virus, first existing as written shapes, found its way into our biology, into our brains. We became its host, and our larynx and musculature evolved such that eventually we could speak. All thanks to, or from Burroughs' perspective, at the command of, the language virus. This was its plan for us all along. Our evolution is the one way the language virus could survive. And so it helped us do that. This symbiosis, us and the language virus, has had some side effects too, says Burroughs. Words have power, and the language virus lets us harness that power in very tricky ways if we know how to. If we know the effective phrases and the best ways to use those phrases, we can cause the language virus to affect almost instantly other parts of a person's biology or psychology. Say certain sentences, certain arrangements of words and people will get ill, for instance. In a way, Burroughs talks about how our brains can function as a kind of decoder ring, that deep within the recesses of our cognitive faculties there is some process, partially involuntary, which extracts language virus created word power and acts upon it. Burroughs describes how one might record the sounds of animals fighting, people coughing or sniffling while talking, stammering while delivering speeches or having sex on a number of tape recorders. Splice up the tapes, cut them each into little pieces, rearrange all the pieces and tape them back together. Play the spliced tapes out in public at political rallies and parties and see what happens. Don't play them loudly, just however loud you can. Use small, portable electronics on your person, walk around, stand in crowds, no PA needed, just quietly subject the people to these cut-up sounds, and in not long, watch politicians become unable to perform. Watch people get ill. Watch actual riots break out. All from these tapes and the power of the word. Not recognizable, not perceivable, but powerful. The language virus. This is essentially the same principle as all those self-help tapes, just inverted. Instead of the listener willingly subjecting themselves to some subliminal message in the hopes of bettering themselves, it's the listener unknowingly being subjected to subliminal messages in the hopes of causing trouble. It is, I think, the same kind of mysticism. It's the secret power of a media to influence our person because there is something deeply mysterious or vexing about how that person operates. And also, importantly, how that media operates. It's in his reversal that Burroughs, unlike the subliminal self-help tape manufacturers and even those researchers, ends up focusing on the tape itself 
the actual technology of recording and playback, which, through a kind of bizarre weaponization, Burroughs has to make practical. He has to operationalize it. He has to confront working with it, using it, its materiality. None of the subliminal self-help tape research, none of the tape manufacturers, focus on the tape, the cassette, the players, only the content. And for sure, the mysticism is there in the content, but I think for more people than we tend to recognize, for more people than the total set which owns a tinfoil hat, that mysticism is also there in the tape, the cassette, the recorder, the machine, and the medium itself. Burroughs talks about splicing and rearranging tape, deploying players and recorders in public, but he also talks about people as tape recorders, our brains and their processes as tape recorders. Another effect of the language virus. He talks about God as a tape recorder, or maybe it was the tape recorder as God. It's all very manic and paranoid, but it does fully seize upon this mysticism of magnetic tape. When it was first invented, recording technology was paraded around as the incredible talking machine. It wasn't a machine playing back recordings of people in other places at other times. It was itself a machine that was talking. This is actually the story behind the old Victor advertisements featuring that white dog with the black ears. Nipper was his name. And he's looking into the horn of the phonograph, looking for his master. HMV stands for his master's voice. So clear and powerful was this machine, so mystical, it could, at the very least, confound a dog. By the time we reach the 1980s and magnetic tape is everywhere, we're not so nonplussed by the disembodied human voice, but that doesn't mean the mechanical operation of the medium isn't a kind of practical voodoo. To look at an LP, one sees the grooves, visual, physical representations of the sounds coming out of the speakers. To look at the magnetic tape contained within a cassette, one sees a solid black or brown field. Delicate, sensitive, with a shelf life, and possessing no shortage of unique sonic characteristics in comparison to the various recorded media which came before and after it. A thought experiment. Does a subliminal, self-help vinyl record seem ridiculous to you? What about a subliminal self-help CD or MP3? They seem ridiculous to me. Surely they exist in some form or another, but what I'm trying to get at here is that these other formats, to me at least, and I'm, I'm perfectly willing to be completely alone here, they feel wrong for this kind of thing. Each of these other formats feels more... I don't know, analytical, present, something, not lending as much to the idea of subliminal auditory messages encoded underneath new-aged synth music, playing on a Walkman while you sit on your bed or at the beach or, I, I don't know, wherever people listen to subliminal tapes. Of all these media, tape has such life, and I don't just mean that in the way that when you ask someone, hey, why do people like analog better than digital? And they're like, oh man, you know, it's just, it's alive. I mean that the format itself has this personality. If vinyl is hipsters and collectors and MP3s slash CDs are, uh, you know, e everyone, then tape is the weird, dare I say, liminal space between the two. Stuff still gets released on tape today, noise records, mostly synthy stuff, but popularly, by and large, the format is done. However, for all of the time it was around, which was really comparatively, at least, not very long, it bears the marks of the strengthening global musical and culture industries, the portability of electronics, and the creation of sonic personal space out in public thanks to the Walkman, the sharing of media, the personalized sharing of media through the mixtape, and just a million other things which are part and parcel with music now. And so, I don't know, maybe I would venture that in addition to whatever power the word has over us, might there also be some power held by magnetic tape itself? 
By and large, it seems like the subliminal auditory message tapes that did sell only sold because they said the word subliminal on the front. James Vickery, the guy who conducted that first subliminal messaging experiment, eventually admitted that his whole thing was just to attract customers to his down-in-the-dumps marketing firm. It's kind of the opposite of subliminal when you think about it. So yeah, yes, definitely. It is the packaging and the marketing, the new AG music and the placebo effect and all those other things, but maybe also, even in some really small way, the sway of the iron oxide coating and the hiss and something about the whole mysterious and particular way of the tape itself. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go see a man about some tinfoil hats. My name is Mike Rignetta, and this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Instagram and Twitter at ReasonablySND, and you can find me on Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram at Mike Rugnetta. I'll let Vanessa Hill let you know where you can find her. You can find me on Twitter or Instagram as Nessie Hill, N-E-S-S-Y-H-I-L-L. Uh, on YouTube is Braincraft. If you're interested in brain things and want to learn more, it's youtube.com forward slash braincraft. Check it out. Thank you, Vanessa. No worries. And of course, a clear and consciously stated thank you to the Infinite Guest Network from American Public Media. Around the world, Huskadoo means do you remember? A memory exerciser that's fun for children, fun for everybody, a great family game. 